Good morning. Our opening hymn is Part of the Family, verses 1 and 2. May be seated. Come in, come in and sit down. You are a part of the family. Welcome to worship today. Um, we have a lot happening, as it seem, I seem to say every Sunday that I stand up here, <laughs> but we do. Uh, one of the first things, I'm going to be talking to the kids in a few minutes about this stole, but I want to tell you that this stole was a gift to me a couple of years ago. Uh, my friends Tony and Andy were engaged and they were planning on getting married, but they hadn't picked a date until there was a news article saying that in Almond, somebody had climbed up and they had torn down the pride flag off of the, um, the pole that was over the, um, the building where they do all of the fabric and things, and the, the museum. And so that was the moment when Andy decided, he'd grown up in Almond, he decided when he was getting married and where, as soon as possible and right under the new pride flag. And so they called and asked if I was available, and another friend, Sue Dacey, uh, made me my rainbow stole so that I would be in keeping. So I wear it today for our affirming celebration. We have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one, a uh, rather sad announcement that I know a lot of you will want to know. A founding member of this congregation, Jack Reeder, has passed away. He passed away on Thursday, May 11th and he was um, residing in London, Ontario uh, with his wife, Barb. And so our thoughts go out to the Reader family at this time. Also, Stefan has asked if he could make an announcement. So Stefan, if you'd like to come forward now. Good morning. So as many of you know, I'm the youth leader guy thing, doesn't really have a title, you know. I'm the guy that deals with youth stuff. So I'm pleased to uh, say that we're, uh, youth events have finished for the season and, are, um, and the ne uh, next thing of youth things will start in the fall. And we'll start with a bang. I'm not sure what that bang will be yet, but we'll start with a bang. Um, we have had su like success, success with people coming out to events and people having fun and really enjoying stuff. And we've had been having things on Friday evenings for the last while. And it's been fun. It's been great. In, uh, and also we've started to have uh, joint events. Um, the ages for the Bearhaven events are 11 to 16 and the ages for the joint events are um, 12, to six, uh, 12 to 16. And the joint events are with 
Canada United, Stittsville United, and I keep on forgetting the name, but it's the Anglican Church in Stittsville. Everyone's going to remind me about it. Yeah, that one, St. Thomas. Um, but next week on, yeah, on Friday, there's an event at Canada United um, at, from 7 to 9, if I, my memory serves me correctly. Um, if you, um, it's a cleanup for the um, cleanup of the area around the church in Canada. But um, I won't be there, but you're more than, if you're in that age group, you're more than welcome to come. If you want more info, you can email me, and I'll direct you to um, Janet's email, the, my colleague at uh, Canada United. But we'll start again with probably a, like a joint events and more bar, uh, events at Barhaven that are going to be more organized and more fun, because I finally have to, time to organize it, in the fall. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. <clears throat> As many of you know, it's a one-year anniversary today of uh, Barhaven United Church becoming an affirming congregation, and so part of our celebration will pick up on that, and we have members of the affirming ministry who will be taking part. <laughs> and at this time, let us take a moment um, just to center ourselves in worship. I'm not going to use the word silence because I don't want any parents to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so just take a moment for, to center into worship. At this point, we have a video that we're going to watch, and it's a song entitled, You Are a Rainbow. This song was composed by a very good friend of mine, David Kai, who worked in Ottawa at Orleans United Church as a diaconal minister. He now lives in southern Ontario. Um, this, this song is beautiful, the hymns are very poignant, but more so when you know a little bit about David's story. His grandparents were Japanese Canadians uh, who were part of the internment camps during the First World War. These, this was when people um, on the West Coast were sent to internment camps if they were Japanese. And when they were eventually released, they no longer had homes to go to. Their houses were sold, all of their belongings were sold, and they were no longer allowed to live on BC's coast. And so many of them moved inland, and uh, David's grandparents and his parent, his father, moved to Toronto. And so that's a little bit of his background. Uh, his daughter, uh, Mariko, is, going to, is singing the vocals, and uh, I would also mention that uh, one of David's other daughters, uh, Michiko, is a non-binary ordained uh, minister, and so she works uh, tirelessly in the United Church, as David has, to, uh, to talk about inclusion and affirmation, and all of these things will be in the video. I invite you to watch. The, the images are beautiful. If you decide you want to sing along and the Spirit moves you, feel free.
Please join me in the call to worship for Affirming Sunday. God, when you called each of us into being, you delighted in your works. You gifted us with differences that illuminate the breadth, breadth of beauty, wisdom, and practices of love in your creation. In whatever ways we still struggle to accept and celebrate our own unique offerings, strains or condemns your good work in us. Welcome us into worship that is a reflection of your spirit. Amen. Our hymn is called Circle of Song. This was composed by Tony Turner. Tony is a friend of Sid's, and so when we were planning our service, uh, Sid approached Barb and asked if we could sing this song. Apparently it was sung one year ago today. I invite you to remain seated for Circle of Song and to join in the refrain. The choir is going to lead the verses.
Uh, Nancy is part of the affirming ministry, and when we were having a conversation about um, about the issues around around this ministry, she told a story that I thought really embodied what this service is all about. Today, Barhaven United Church is celebrating the first anniversary of our church becoming an affirming congregation. In addition to supporting the two SLBGTQ community. This designation also includes supporting the black community, making our church wheelchair accessible, and addressing poverty concerns. Today, I want to tell you about the experience of a young 19-year-old man who started attending our church a little over 25 years ago. He quickly joined the choir, singing tenor, and sitting next to my husband, Rob, who also sang tenor at that time, and they quickly became friends. Soon he was coming for family suppers and also stopping by for other reasons. As we got to know him, he felt comfortable enough to tell us he was gay. He also told us that his family made inappropriate remarks about gay people, and he was happy he could be himself with all of our family. Eventually, he spent all holidays at our house. We know as a congregation that we are welcoming, but if you are a member of the 2SLBGT community, unless there is signage outside your church, plus on your order of service, website, and Facebook, then you don't know if they will feel safe and accepted. Because many churches are still not accepting of people of different sexual orientations, it is important that these symbols of affirming be promptly displayed. To become affirming is an automatic. There are requirements for a church to become affirming. We also followed a booklet called Open Hearts, which offers resources for affirming ministries in the United Church of Canada. Once we had fulfilled these requirements, we were able to apply to become an affirming congregation. This process took us approximately two years. We are still an active affirming committee, always willing to continue to learn. And I want you to join me in prayer. I um, just want to get it here, make sure I have my stuff here. Okay. Beloved one, you embrace, your embrace is a refuge from violence and hatred. Those who have been turned away, forgotten, or persecuted find belonging in you. And can you join me here? We hope to embody such love in this place. May we be a sanctuary, a shelter, a safe place to turn. May we endeavor to learn from each other and grow together in love that protects and uplifts. 
Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward, and if some of them are really young, then their parents can bring them. Come on. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Come on up. Come on. You can stand up here. This is a great place to be. Hi. Hi. Hi, Eleanor. So I mentioned my stole earlier in the service today, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Does this stole remind you of anything? Hi. Does it remind you of anything? Yes? A rainbow. You're absolutely right. This stole is like a rainbow. It has all of the colors of the rainbow in it. Now, I'll tell you what I like about the rainbow. The rainbow is in the Bible, and the rainbow reminds us that God loves us, that God loves all the world. But the rainbow is in itself a symbol of how everybody is welcome and included and loved. And I'll tell you why. The rainbow is created when light shines through raindrops and it acts like a prism. And so the light inside of the white light all separates into the bands of color. And so we see all the different colors of the rainbow. Now, rainbows are really, really beautiful. They're made up of different colors. Each color is different. Each color is unique. And each color is necessary to make a rainbow. So while the rainbow we see in the sky has seven different colors, we need all of those to make one rainbow. And that reminds me of people because people are all different, and they're all unique, and everyone is special and loved. And we all have different skills and abilities and talents. Hi. And, <laughs> and we are all necessary for God's world to be complete. And to me, that's why a rainbow is a symbol of hope. So let us pray. I invite everyone to pray after me, saying, Thank you, God, for rainbows. Thank you, God, for people everywhere. Thank you, God, for our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, and thank you for coming forward and participating in the children's time. And you can go back to your seats. As we pause, we are reminded that Jesus is the Word of God, meaning that Jesus' life is the living model of how to live fully and completely in the world, in alignment with all that you wish for us and this world, O Creator. We pray that you, O God, will help us understand your dream of wholeness for us and for all of creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our service continues with the scripture by Tom Stone. Good morning. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. This as I have kept my Father's command, 
and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. May the Spirit bless your understanding of the Holy Scripture. There's a lovely story about an elementary school teacher who handed out art supplies to a group of six-year-old children and invited them to create a picture of anything that they would like, anything at all. At the back of the classroom sat a little girl who normally did not pay attention in school, and yet this day was different. She was absolutely focused and absorbed on her drawing for about 20 minutes. Well, eventually the teacher's curiosity got the better of her, and she approached the girl and she asked her what she was drawing. And without even looking up, the little girl said, I am drawing a picture of God. Surprised, the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl replied, they will when I'm done. <laughs> when I was six, I had a pretty clear picture of what God looked like. God was an old man with long white hair and flowing white robes seated on a big marble throne surrounded by fluffy white clouds. I was certain because that was how God was portrayed in every picture that I had ever seen. Many years ago, I heard about an author who traveled the world and asked children to draw pictures of God. Well, not surprisingly, the pictures were reflections of the cultures in which the children lived, with every color and every feature that was found in the human race. As a 22-year-old student at Queen's Theological College in my first year, I was asked to rewrite, read and the Articles of Faith for the Basis of Union and then rewrite them in my own words. Article 4 states that God is the creator of all things and that he made man in his own image. Well, I wrote what I believed, that we made God in our image. I went on to say that the image of God as presented in religion is a human construct, and the human language is simply inadequate to define God in all of God's glory. So, we use images that are familiar to us, images that have meaning in our lives. But if we really study the metaphors that are presented in the Bible, we soon realize that the image of God is far more diverse than we give it credit. To begin with, any argument about God's gender is irrelevant, and it certainly is not restricted to that old man sitting on the throne. We need only look at the first chapter of Genesis when God was creating this universe and everything in it. Because on the sixth day, this is what God said, and I'm quoting from the Bible. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Male and female, he created them. It's subtle, especially with all of those he and him words woven in there. But God chooses the possessive pronoun our. And their, their image is expressed in the creation of both male 
and female. That's what God said. I have to admit that when I was a child, the image of God as father was really important to me. I grew up in a single-parent home, and by the time I was six, I already had committed the Lord's Prayer to memory. And so when I said my prayers at night, I was speaking to my Father in heaven, using the words that Jesus himself taught his disciples. But that word Jesus used for Father, Abba, even that's a little different than we might think because when you translate it literally, it's a very familiar term like dad or daddy. It is a familiar term that only Jesus used. But he shared it with us as an affirmation that we are all a part of his family. It says so in chapter 8 of Paul's letter to the Romans where he explains to those led by the Spirit of God that they are the children of God. He said, it is not a spirit that enslaves or causes us to live in fear. Rather, it is a spirit that brought about our adoption into God's family and testifies that we are all God's children. I think this speaks volumes to us on this Affirmation Sunday and Christian Family Sunday. It is a reminder that we are all part of God's family and we are all heirs of God's grace, not because of what we've done, but what God has done through Christ. I could end here, but in honor of Mother's Day, I would like to spend a few minutes on how the Bible portrays our Heavenly Father as our Heavenly Mother. Hosea described God saying, Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, I who took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. God said, I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and I fed them. From Deuteronomy, like the eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over her young, God spreads wings to catch you and carries you on God's wings. Isaiah, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Deuteronomy, you were unmindful of, unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Isaiah, for a long time I have held my peace. I have kept myself still and restrained myself. But now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. Isaiah 49, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Yet even if these forget, I will never forget you. And lest we think that all of the images of God as mother in the Bible are soft and kind and gentle, in Hosea, I will attack them like a bear robbed of her cubs and devour them like a lioness, like a wild beast. The Bible is filled with hundreds of metaphors for God, yet Christians tend to limit ourselves to only a few. In her book, Wearing God, Clothing, Laughter, Fire, and Other Overlooked Ways of Meeting God, Episcopal priest Dr. Lauren Winner tries on overlooked metaphors for how we, have, how we meet and experience God. Chapters on God as clothing, as laughter, God as flame, as food, as wine, and a laboring woman not only invite us to understand God in a new way, but each reveals God to be much more intimate than we imagine, opening up an opportunity for experiencing God more deeply in our own lives. Our theme for today from John 15 relies heavily on the image of God as Father, but it still has much to offer on this affirming Christian family and Mother's Day Sunday. To begin with, let us put the passage into context. It follows immediately after Christ's affirmation, I am the fine, you are the branches. Then he says, 
if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And the glory of God is revealed when you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus goes on to say that we remain in his love if we keep his commands. And then he clarifies by saying, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. There are over 600 commandments in the Bible. But once again, Jesus has made it really easy for us. Love one another. Three weeks ago, I brought a tree into our worship service that is now planted out in Britannia United Church's community garden. You may recall that it is an apple tree, but no ordinary apple tree because it can produce five different varieties of apples. How can it do this? Well, an experienced arborist took one tree and grafted four different branches onto it. The new branches are now equally part of the tree and they add to the fullness of its being. But they still maintain their unique identities and they will bear fruit that is true to their nature. For me, there could be no better metaphor for the Christian family. In the words of Paul, we are adopted into the family of Christ through the grace of God. On this affirming Sunday, we are reminded that being adopted into this family does not mean that we have to hide or sacrifice our identity. Rather, as we are nourished in this loving environment, we are encouraged to bear fruit that is true to ourselves. And on this Mother's Day, when we are called to peaceful action, this brings me back to the story that Nancy shared. One of the things that many LGBTQ plus people have in common is that so many of them have been shunned and rejected by their families. Speaking their truth so that they might be true to their nature has led many of these folks to being abandoned, alone, homeless, or worse. This is why creating an affirming place of worship where people can be true to themselves and find their place in a Christian family is so important. For some, it will be a place where they can bear fruit. For others, it will save their very lives. And for us who live out the commandment to love one another, it will bring glory to God, our Heavenly Father and Mother, and all shall know that we are their disciples. Amen. Thank you. 
we continue with a litany of faith and hope. We are a garden, a community of many different colors and varieties growing together. We all need water, sun, and soil to grow. We live alongside one another, respecting one another, maintaining our identities like an iris and a carnation, both beautiful, both distinct and different, but still connected. We come together. We seek, we need, we believe, we believe, we believe. We believe, we believe, and we know. There are many kinds of gifts, and we are called to share our gifts. They are as diverse as our community. At this time, we bring up our offering. Loving God, just as you have created us and love each of us equally, we pray that you would accept our gifts and use them to further your purpose in the world, to further your cause of love and justice and welcome for all. Amen. I invite you to be seated. We're about to enter into our prayer for the day. I'd like to just pause for a moment and tell you a little bit about Mother's Day that maybe you don't know. Today is recognized as Mother's Day and Christian Family Sunday in the United Church. It's a day when we honor and celebrate women who have made positive contributions to our lives and to our world. Some have given birth to us, but in the wisdom of the African nation, it takes a village to raise a child. So today we honor all of the women who have inspired us all along the way. One of those women is Julia Ward Howe. She was a prominent American abolitionist, feminist, poet, and author. You might recognize her name as the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic with its glory, glory, hallelujah. But she also nursed and tended wounded soldiers during the American Civil War and worked with widows and orphans of soldiers on both sides. It was her first-hand witness of the consequences of war that inspired her to call out for women to rise up through the ashes and devastation. The result was an appeal to womanhood throughout the world, which later became known as the Mother's Day Proclamation. This proclamation called upon mothers of all nationalities to band together to promote the amicable settlement of international questions in the great and general interests of peace. She believed that women had a responsibility to shape their societies at the political level, and she envisioned a day 
of solemn council where women from all over the world could meet to discuss how world peace might be achieved. The initial proclamation was written in 1870, but it would be more than 40 years before Mother's Day would be declared an official holiday in the United States. Canada would follow in 1915. It's interesting to note that the woman who was finally successful in the establishment of Mother's Day in the US was Anna Jarvis, who was inspired by her own mother who had worked alongside Julia Ward Howe. Mother's Day already has many layers of meaning. But let us keep the wisdom of Julia Ward Howe close to our hearts today as we honor the women, all women, who have inspired us in a world that still cries out for peace. Amen. There's a table in the front. Prayer, prayers of the community, I would like to read a Mother's Day prayer. Loving God, help us make Mother's Day even more meaningful. Help us make it even more of a celebration of those extraordinary people in our lives we call mom. Some who are like mothers to us and people of all genders who offer mothering care. Help us make Mother's Day even more supportive of mothers who have lost children, children who have lost mothers, women who long to be mothers, and those who choose not to be mothers but still inspire and care for the generations to come. Help us make it more open to those who don't fit the traditional model of family and feel left out during this holiday. Help us make it more caring of single moms, new moms, and those looking after their moms during the pandemic without the social supports that are usually in place. Help us make it more aware of those whose mothering responsibilities stretch across decades and generations to span a lifetime. Help us to make it more loving for those who want to draw closer to their mother and more healing for those who need to keep a distance. Help us make Mother's Day more, O oh God, more generous, more open, more caring. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. When I was searching for material to use today, I came across a prayer to our mother, which art upon heaven. Apparently, this prayer was also offered at, by Jesus at the same time that he taught the traditional Lord's Prayer on the Sermon on the Mount. It was discovered in the secret archives of the Vatican and translated by Edmund Bordeaux Sakely around 1928. It is now part of the Essene Gospel of Peace, and I offer it to you today to pray with me so that we might be truly inclusive of our God who is mother and father of us all. Let us pray. Our mother, which art upon earth, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in us as it is in thee. As thou sendest every day thy angels, send them to us also. Forgive us our sins as we atone all our sins against thee and lead us not into sickness, 
but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the earth, the body, and the health. Amen. I invite you to join me in singing the hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. Beloved, let us go with hearts full of courage. Let us go with minds open to experiencing God. And let us go with joy. And let us go forward singing, We Shall Go Out with Hope of Resurrection. Mm -hmm. 